Following the recovery from the Ordovician mass extinction, we started to see our world develop a lot of ecosystems that at least loosely resembled some of what we see today. In the seas, complex food webs of arthropods and fish were starting to thrive. And on land, we were starting to see something akin to the very first forests. But instead of trees, the tallest organisms were strange forms of fungus that evolved into 8 meter tall pillars and the true plants remaining closer to the forest floor. The relatively stable climate of the Silurian allowed life the chance to bounce back. But by the beginning of the Devonian, competition was about to pick up all culminating into the first really big evolutionary arms race. On one side, we had the arthropods, who had dominated most marine ecosystems since the Cambrian explosion. And on the other was the early vertebrates, who had been at a bit of a disadvantage without armored bodies that came in the form of exoskeletons. But ever since the evolution of Jaws, our ancestors were at least able to fight back. And around 419 million years ago, as the Silurian ended and the Devonian began, a surprising thing started to happen. We were about to start winning, because at least one group of fish were starting to become every bit as defensive as the arthropods. And this would also give them the tools that they needed to become the apex predators in this increasingly bountiful world. I cannot help you, but you know what can help you? A fish with a guillotine for a face. How is this better? Huh. You may have a point. Maybe we should come up with a new strategy to get through this period. But we have a ton to get into before we even get into that. So let's dive into the Devonian. As I stated in the last episode, the Silurian was a pretty stable time in geologic and climactic terms. During the Devonian, Gondwana would remain as the largest landmass on the planet. Over the 61 million years, it would start to move slightly northwestward, but still remaining entirely in the southern hemisphere. But several smaller landmasses had broken off of both Gondwana and Euro-America and kind of formed a closed-off seaway from the massive Panthalassic Ocean. We call it the Paleotethys Sea. And it, along with a narrow seaway called the Ryak Ocean, would become the stage of a lot of noteworthy things that were about to start happening during this time. As far as the climate goes, the Devonian continued in a relatively warm trend, but there was a little more fluctuation than before. There probably was no ice at the poles, but because there was no ice, sea levels were very high, leading to an abundance of warm, shallow marine habitats. This was something that had been slowly building up for a while, but, with more and more shallow seas opening up, more different kinds of organisms can move in and adapt. In general, shallow seas are comparatively more productive than deep oceans because sunlight has an easier time penetrating shallow water. This allows photosynthetic organisms to spread, which makes up the base of any food web. We saw all that get started in the Silurian, but now after so long with such stable conditions, many different groups were going to start struggling for dominance. And the ones that make the cut would be the ones that learn to take advantage of the new biomes that were becoming available. Today, coral reefs support countless different species of animals. They're basically the marine equivalent of tropical rainforests in terms of biodiversity. And corals have existed in some form ever since the Cambrian explosion but they weren't building up the giant, calcified structures that we would think of today. At least not yet. The thing about corals is, they've always been really picky about things like ocean temperature and oxygen level and all that. And throughout the Silurian and going into the Devonian, the water temperature was too warm for corals to spread into full-blown reefs. But there was another organism capable of forming reefs during this time. The very same things that have stuck around ever since the Archean. The cyanobacteria. Ever since that now distant time, some species of goo had formed colonies and built up over time into structures called stromatolites. These would become the basis for some of the very first reefs, and likely had been an ecosystem that benefited life for millions of years. But as we get into the Middle Devonian, the climate and ocean temperatures would drop slightly. Now it wasn't a lot, but it was enough to make a big difference for the rugose corals that were around at the time. 
because even though corals are picky, once conditions are favorable, they spread much faster than the cyanobacteria can form stromatolites. So by the middle Devonian, we see a shift to the first large coral reefs that have been on Earth since they were largely wiped out by the Ordovician extinction. These reefs were populated by many creatures that we would consider familiar at this point in our journey, as well as a few new faces. The trilobites had fully recovered from their hit that they took at the end of the Ordovician as well, covering the sea floor like the invincible little troopers they are. But in the open water column, a new group of animals was going to appear that was one day going to become an even more common piece of the fossil record than the indestructible pill bugs. And it would be coming from a group that famously doesn't fossilize very well. This is when the very first ammonites appeared. Ammonites are cephalopods. So these guys were distant descendants of the monstrous carrot krakens that ruled during the Ordovician. They were still carnivorous like all other cephalopods, but it seems like the title of Apex Predator was not within their reach. Especially when you consider how much competition for that title was starting to ramp up. Throughout the entire Silurian period, one group of animals was king. The Eurypterids were still going strong by the beginning of the Devonian, and environmentally there didn't seem to be very much to keep them down. But despite this, we do see a steep drop-off in the sea scorpion populations at this time. Scientists believe that this is because of new competition that would raise the stakes in the world's oceans. Up until now, jawless fish were the most common fish on Earth. But the vertebrates did manage to branch off into a couple different variations leading up into the Devonian. And that was all laying the groundwork for what was to come. It was now time for two groups to rise up and dethrone the arthropods. This is when the fish with skeletons comprised of flexible cartilage started to become more active predators. The very earliest sharks or cladodonts. And you would think that the first appearance of sharks would be a pretty big deal for marine ecosystems. But really, they were kind of playing second fiddle to the real monsters of this time. The second group of fish to rise up. The ones with bony armor on the outside. This group is called the Placoderms, and they are unlike any fish that we have today. They had jaws, but technically no teeth, at least not in the same sense as you would think. Instead, the armored plates that made up the skulls formed a blade-like structure sort of similar to a beak. And with these tools and defenses, this group of fish didn't just break out as top predators. They started to explode into every possible niche they could. Even the smaller species were so defensive that the only things that could effectively feed on them were bigger placoderms. And that brings me to the thing that I know y'all wanted me to talk about, the biggest and baddest of the placoderms, Dunkleosteus. This nearly 9 meter, 4 ton monster was as far as we know the biggest organism that has existed up until this point. And there is no question that this was an apex predator. Its bite force was focused into the fang tips at the front of the jaw, measuring up to 80,000 PSI? I, I actually had to double check this. For context, the maximum estimated bite force of a Nile crocodile is around 5,000 PSI. So this thing could bite 16 times harder than a, a large crocodile. And it basically had a guillotine in its mouth. With this thing at the top of the food chain, there really is no wonder why there was a sudden turn to more defensive forms. Arthropods were armored like the placoderms, but the way these new fish predators were armored in the front with powerful muscled tails in the back and a flexible spine, they were doing everything we had seen in other parts of the animal kingdom only better. And since predators drive the evolution of prey by removing the individuals who don't cut it from the population, Everything else on Earth was starting to evolve into the Placoderm's world. The Stylonuria sea scorpions would manage to hold on by not competing directly. But unfortunately, the Eurypterina sea scorpions were just going to fall victim to this power shift. It seems like if you couldn't keep up, the best survival strategy was to get away and avoid the armored fish at all cost. And it would be this pressure that drives one of the most momentous events in the history of life on Earth. One small step for fish. One 
one giant leap for vertebrate kind. With life in the oceans becoming so dangerous, it's not surprising to think that if there was an alternative available, some organisms were going to go for it. And meanwhile on land, as more complex rooted plants started to evolve, this allowed soils to stabilize for the first time, and the plants started to grow larger. This would change the dynamic of terrestrial ecosystems forever. Previously in the Silurian, the giant fungus, like Prototaxtides, were the largest things on land. But as the Devonian went on, they started to slowly get replaced by the very first large plants. It's unknown exactly why the fungal trees were failing while large plants were managing to survive. But one theory is that plants were better equipped to defend against being preyed on by arthropods, which there was starting to become a considerable variety. Things like centipedes and millipedes were common, and the arachnids like true scorpions, mites, and a strange group that looked like a cross between a tick or a mite and a spider called the trigonotarbids had begun to diversify. Throughout the Silurian, the invertebrates were left unchallenged on the land, but now it was time for that to change. As the plants spread across the land, even far away from waterways, along the coasts, you would find the very first vertebrates making the leap onto land, the tetrapods. I has feet. They evolved from the lobe-finned fish that, to be honest, were struggling just as much to deal with the armored fish as, well, everything else. But this would give them the chance to survive. Now, this might seem like very humble beginnings, and, well, it is. These things were basically something between a salamander and a mudskipper. But their success is undeniable. Different species started popping up all over the Devonian world. Using their limbs that were still something in between fins and feet, which in different species like Tiktaalik and Archaeostega had eight digits on each, they were able to haul themselves up out of the reach of the placoderms. And in this new world, they would likely become predators. With eyes positioned on the top of their heads and sharp needle-like teeth, it's thought that they were the very first animals to make use of the ambush hunting at the water's edge strategy that we would see many times in the future. These animals are a big deal to our understanding of life because every single organism that lives today and has a backbone and lives on land can trace their ancestry to the pioneering creatures of this time. Although they were still tied to the water, especially to reproduce, this was the blueprint of things to come. And it was lucky that we made this leap when we did, because as we come to the end of the Devonian, the world's oceans were about to hit hard times once again. The late Devonian extinction is not very well understood. A few things we can say, however, is one, it doesn't appear to have been a single event, but rather multiple events that caused it. And two, the effects were much more severe in the oceans than on land or in freshwater ecosystems. One theory is that an asteroid impact may have been to blame for part of it, but to many scientists this doesn't really check out. For one thing, so far there's been no impact site found, but that doesn't really matter because 350 million years has passed since then, and there wouldn't be that much of a crater with that much time to erode. But the fact is that an asteroid impact would have equal effect on both land and sea, so most people think that it must have been an event that was specific to the oceans. The most popular theory is that something caused the oxygen levels in the oceans to plummet. This would have an adverse effect on many of the different groups that rose to dominance over the 61 million year period. Brachiopods, trilobites, and ammonites would all be hit hard by this, but they would pull through. But the worst effects were to the marine vertebrates. As much as 96% of them were wiped out in the last few million years of the Devonian. The bony and cartilaginous fish managed to hang on, but unfortunately the armored placoderms were not so lucky. These animals were extremely well adapted to be the kings of the oceans, and they were the first vertebrates to take control away from the inverts. And although their rule was short when you look at the total story of life on Earth, it showed for the first time that the body plan of an internal skeleton is not inherently inferior to an exoskeleton. But once again, it also shows that whenever a catastrophic change in the world takes place, it's the ones on top that have the most to lose. Whenever there's a major ecosystem collapse, the animals at the top of the food chain 
are normally the ones that are going to struggle the most to get what they need to survive. Whatever the cause of the die-off at the end of the Devonian, our direct ancestors like Tiktaalik were relatively unaffected. In fact, as this period came to a close, they were actually becoming more abundant than ever. And now the land was growing even more hospitable and trees started to spread across the globe and eventually from pole to pole would be covered in an endless tropical forest. And that would be the stage for the next chapter in the Odyssey of Life. I want to thank everyone for watching this video through to the end. This has been one of the most anticipated chapters in the History of the Earth series, and I wanted to make sure that I covered some of the most notable events that took place. This script was actually a doozy, and I had to rewrite it probably three times, which is why it took a little bit longer than usual. So I hope you all enjoyed this look into our world up to 358 million years ago. If you did, let me know by giving this video a like. And comment and let me know if there's any specific topics that you would like for me to cover in the future. Many of the videos I've already done have come from direct requests from viewers who have asked a question that caught my interest. And if you enjoyed this series, don't forget to subscribe for more. I don't know how long it's going to take me, but eventually I will see this through to the end. Have a good one, everybody.